everybody. Welcome to the Pod TV Network I'm with Economics with the Honorable David M. Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States of America. And today we're going to be looking at, of course, the, um, the budget or this new bill that was passed, $1.2 trillion with a lot of earmarks, uh, which we're going to look at detail, or basically your money being thrown away and your grandkids uh, going to have to explain why all these crazy things were done this year, why they're working 20 hours a week. 20 hours a day, excuse me, uh, just to pay interest on a national debt. So with that, uh, we also have a special guest coming in later to who uncovered some uh, more fraud in uh, Washington, D.C. When he was at Sarah Week in Houston, we're going to bring in Rex Lee later on also to, to uh, bring some things on that unfortunately major media doesn't cover. So with that, uh, we're going to bring in the Honorable David M. Walker to explain uh, why we're fritting away with over 51 billion in earmarks plus plus in this latest bill. So the Honorable David M. Walker. Um, what's, I have a whole list of earmarks to go through. So as soon as you're done, I'm going to go through the, just part of them. There's like 5,000 of them. I have part of them to go through. Okay. Well, let me, let me talk about the big picture, and then we can start talking about some of the specific earmarks. You've got a detailed list. Okay. Uh, and Let's uh, focus on the big ticket items, if we will, because there's too many to, to cover them all. Um, look, I am incredibly frustrated with regard to the status quo in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have a Congress who just passed the last of the major appropriations bills, what they call a mini bus. Mini bus is where you combine a bunch of different appropriation bills into one bill and pass that instead of passing the individual bills. The one that was passed was about $1.2 trillion, signed into law by the president over the weekend. That's about 70% of discretionary spending. They had previously signed another mini bus that covered about 30% of discretionary spending. So total discretionary spending is about $1.7 trillion. Basically about the same as was, uh, was spent in fiscal 2023. Uh, and 2022 and 2023 were bloated years uh, in, in large part because of COVID and other related uh, non-recurring spending activities. Um, and so the, the first thing is, is that they, they, they didn't cut spending to the extent that they should have cut spending. But to compound the injury, they included many, many earmarks for items that in some cases had to do with local local or state issues don't have anything to do with federal issues. Uh, and in other cases, they had to do with their woke agenda, promoting LGBTQ type initiatives or other types of activities, if you will. Um, and what's particularly frustrating, Nick, and I know you agree with this, is, you know, it's one thing if we had a surplus and reasonable debt levels to see Congress spending some money on, on items that may or may not be meritorious, um, but, but nonetheless, you know, we would be in a position where we'd be able to do some of that. But, but we're, in a, we're not in that situation. We're in a situation where we have a huge deficit, at least $1.5 trillion this year, at least, uh, where we have excessive debt-to-GDP burdens, where the fastest-growing expense is interest, where interest is now past what we spend on national defense. Uh, and, and yet, you know, they, they act like that uh, we're rolling in dough. Uh, the other thing that's particularly frustrating is the president uh, continues to engage uh, and to propose illegal activities that the, that, that the taxpayers are funding. For example, take the border. Catch and release is illegal. The law says you're supposed to catch and detain, and the, the president has the authority through executive order to send people back, but he doesn't want to do that. So when he says he wants to have more money, he wants to have more money for catch and release uh, and to fly people into the United States to bypass the border, to try to re relieve the pressure on the border. But these people are illegal. And in addition to that, you know, th there, there are monies being spent to house them, to feed them, to provide them health care, and a variety of other things. 
It's just out of control. And now the president is coming back again, saying that he wants to forgive more student loans. Didn't the guy get the message? The Supreme Court told him he didn't have the unilateral authority to do that. I'm sure he's trying to come up with some cockamamie idea about how he thinks he can get around it. Maybe the Supreme Court's going to have to back, get back into the case. But the largest asset on the federal government's balance sheet is student loans. And he's effectively trying to buy votes with our money. And again, in a situation where we're already have too much debt as a percentage of the economy, uh, and, uh, and, and it's projected to get much, much worse uh, in the future. So, you know, it's time that somebody wake up. And I think what's going to have to happen is the first three words in the Constitution are going to have to come alive. We the people. We're responsible and accountable for what does or doesn't happen. There are going to have to be accountability mechanisms this November. Uh, we clearly need a debt to GDP or related uh, constitutional amendment. We clearly need a fiscal uh, uh, commission to be able to put everything on the table and make a package of recommendations to be able to get our house in order. And that was not added to this appropriations bill, which it should have been. Uh, we clearly need term limits uh, because we've got too many career politicians focused on today rather than having to try to create a better tomorrow. So I will tell you, I'm, I've never been more frustrated with how broken things are in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it's time for change and it's time for accountability. And I hope we get it in November. So with that, Nick, I'll turn it back over to you because I understand yeah, I'm, a bit of material. You yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just going to go over some of the $15 billion in pork, according to the New York Times, and some of the earmarks that are out there that uh, your grandkids are going to be paying for. And so when they're working 20 hours a week, you're going to tell them why you're working 20 hours, excuse me, 20 hours a day. Uh, okay, let's start with this one. How about a $1.2 million pride center in New York City? Like, we really need the federal government to fund this, like not. Uh, so this is part of what you call the woke agenda. Now, this one's even worse. $3 billion to the Palo Alto History Museum, the richest city in the United States. We, as taxpayers, have to go into debt to fund how about this? 1.2 million in DACA. Okay. In other words, for the illegal people that are here, let's just hand out 1.2 million. Here's another one. 1 million to the Zora House, which is gender issued in Ohio. Like, are you serious? Well, how about this? Another 3 million to the LBGT community in NYC. Don't they have their own uh, way to raise money? Why does the federal government need to fund this? There's absolutely no reason. And it gets worse. 3.6 million to the Michelle Obama Trail in Georgia. Now, wait, if Georgia wants to fund it, they can do it themselves. The U.S. government is broke. We don't need to fund that trail. It even gets worse. 3 million Gandhi Museum in Texas. By the way, this is part of uh, what everybody's spending their money for. A Gandhi Museum in Texas, 3 million? Uh, I, I don't know. You look, if you want to pay for it in Texas, do it. But they're soaking the American taxpayers. That gets worse. 750,000 for transgenders in Los Angeles. I could absolutely care less. So this is part of the $15 billion pork that was in this bill that everybody's paying for, not to mention, of course, that uh, these are what they call the earmarks, not to mention the big giveaways of PPP loans and the student loans forcing the United States to go into $34 trillion in debt, where the biggest interest that we see is the national debt. It's appalling, it's abomination, really. Uh, to see it. And the non-disclosures by the U.S. media is also appalling as well. I mean, I just, I just look at it, I'm just going, you cannot be serious, David. I mean, seriously, uh, $51 billion went out the door to um, in debt to things that we have no reason to get debt, debt on. I don't know what your thoughts about all these earmarks well, the, the are. I just part of the, shake my head. Nick, the media is part of the problem. Uh, they're complicit uh, in this. And they're complicit with regard to what's going on with regard to these earmarks. They're complicit with regard to not shining enough light on the irresponsible, unethical, and immoral uh, activities dealing with the federal finances. Um, you know, and and so ultimately, all we're left with is an opportunity to hold people accountable accountable at the ballot box. But I come back to what I said before. Unlike forty nine of fifty states. Uh, who have um, 
fiscal responsibility provisions, uh, either statutorily or in their constitution. We don't, uh, and we desperately right. need one. Uh, but we also need to have one that actually works. Uh, and that's not a balanced budget amendment. Let me tell you why I say that. One, it doesn't make sense at the federal level. We need to differentiate uh, investments from operating expenses. In addition to that, uh, we we also have to recognize that the federal government has different roles and responsibilities than states. Uh, and, and we have to uh, focus on how do we constrain the growth of the federal government because it's already grown too big, promised too much, subsidized too many, lost control of the budget. So we've got to constrain the growth of the government uh, as it relates to the size of the economy. Uh, and we have to limit how much debt as a percentage of the economy uh, that we can take on because only a constitutional amendment will bind current and future Congresses. Uh, and I'm working along with a few others to try to make that a reality. But the way that's going to happen is through the states, not through the Congress, uh, because the Congress has mm -hmm. failed uh, to discharge its express enumerated non-discretionary responsibilities under Article 5 because we had more than enough states wanting a convention to focus on this issue, just this issue, not, not rewrite the Constitution, uh, in 79. And Congress has done nothing since then. Uh, and so it, it's time to, to deal with that. And, of course, obviously, you know, we can try to hold people accountable at the ballot box. The problem is because of gerrymandering, because of closed party primaries and because of uh, dark money, uh, you know, in, in campaigns, uh, you know, you, you've you know, we really have a republic that's not representative of nor responsive to the general public. Uh, yeah, not anymore. Uh, we also have Rex Lee, who was at Sarah Week, and he has an announcement to make, which I found quite interesting. Uh, Kim was also at Sarah Week. For those people who don't know what Sarah Week is, Sarah Week is the largest gathering in the Western Hemisphere of the most influential and uh, top um, people in the world, uh, only second only to Devos, and it's in Houston, Texas every year. But Rex, you you uncovered something very interesting in Sarah Week, so... Give us a report yeah. of what happened over there. Well, let's, I want Rex, um, before he goes, to make sure he plays the video first. But. Oh, he has a video? I don't um, see the video up here. Hang on. I've, I've got it. I'll have to share, but I, I don't want to show the video yet because I have to give some uh, background for context first. All right. So okay. um, um, over the last, uh, I'd say since 2018 or 19, I started uh investigating um, how money is uh, how money flows through Washington in regards to um, uh, Congress and and how these tech giants seem to not get uh, uh, the, how these tech giants are seem to not be held accountable um, after these congressional hearings where they really are exposed in terms of their predatory uh, business practices their harmful addictive tech and so forth. So I started to, to look at um, uh, lobbying, tech lobbying in particular, and I started to uncover some things. So as I started covering green technology, I started uh, doing the same thing. I started looking at the lobbyists who were involved in how the money was being uh, spent for uh, green energy initiatives as well. So um, last year, uh, I was able to cover um, Sierra Week and uh, that's when they announced that the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, was passed. And it was like Christmas Day at Sierra Week uh, regarding that and the omnibus bill of 2022 combined. Uh, I think the IRA set aside over $400 billion uh, for green energy initiatives. And the uh, omnibus bill set another $300 million aside. So combined, there, there's over $700 of a billion dollars set aside. That's almost a trillion dollars. And it's not even a trillion. According to Senator Joe Manchin, there's seven year government debt financing attached to it. So it's not like the money was laying around and they could spend it. By the time you get done with the debt financing on the, on the money, it's really gonna cost us 2.8 to $3 trillion for that money. Uh, so it's not, it's not, they keep running around saying it's 700, uh, billion dollars when it's really 2.8 to 3 trillion dollars. 
Uh, that's what the money's going to cost. So John Podesta last year was speaking at Sarah Week, and he made an interesting statement when he was telling all of the energy companies in the audience, and this includes fossil fuel as well as green energy, uh, alternative energy, which includes hydrogen and nuclear. Uh, they're all sitting in the audience, and he's basically saying, hey, it's Christmas Day. Take advantage of government-enabled investment and apply for this uh, $780 billion set aside by the IRA and the omnibus bill for green energy initiatives that you don't have to take out of your corporate profits and invest in the initiatives that you're going to pursue. Um, during this period of time last year, the big oil uh, started rebranding themselves as as uh, green energy companies as well, because they're taking advantage of this as well. So there's not this divide between fossil fuel, uh, oil and gas companies and green energy companies anymore. They have definitely overlapped. And what you're seeing is centralization of green energy technology through actually what were termed the big oil companies uh, are now um, able to qualify for this uh, IRA funds as well as omnibus funds. And they're, they're either buying these green energy companies or partnering with them. And other major corporations are too. And uh, so you're, you're starting to see an overlap as these companies are starting to centralize energy as a whole. So when, God, when John Podesta says that you, want, you should take advantage of this government enabled investment, He's really suggesting that the government is going to be the central authority for energy policies going forward, whether it's fossil fuel or green energy. What he fails to, to define in his statement is the fact that it's not government enabled investment. It's taxpayer enabled investment. Mm -hmm. It's our tax dollars uh, that's going towards it. And it's not to benefit the U.S. taxpayer. We were told um, several times before the IRA passed, which is really the, the Green New Deal, uh, they just called it the Investment uh, and uh, the, Reduction, the Inflation Reduction Act um, and the Omnibus Bill. We were told over and over that that money was set aside so that the U.S. could lead the world in green energy production, research and development and sales and so forth, that we would be the green energy leaders. And that's how that money was supposed to be spent. So um, one of the companies in particular that I was uh, researching was uh, Lithium of Americas or Lithium Americas is, is, is how they're titled. Well, they're not from America. They're from Canada. And Lithium Americas was awarded the, the, the number one uh, uh, lithium mine, the largest lithium deposits in America are in Thacker Pass, Nevada, and they were awarded the mining contract to dig or mine for lithium at Thacker Pass. Lithium is, is classified as a rare earth element. Um, and then uh, there are also rare earth minerals that can be mined for like cobalt. Uh, and the, these are significant for electric batteries, mainly for EVs or electric vehicles smartphones, connected products, anything that's supported by a lithium battery, um, they need this element in there. The problem with uh, uh, Lithium Americas is their number one investor was Gan Feng Lithium Company, LTD, out of China. They were a majority shareholder in the company when they were, um, when they were awarded the bid. However, what they went ahead and did was GM got involved in the deal uh, and they wanted the lithium and so did Ford and Tesla. So Ford and Tesla uh, partnered with another lithium company in America and they competed for the rights, but uh, Lithium Americas out of Canada won. And uh, so Ford and Tesla were out. Uh, and what GM said they were going to do was displace Gang Feng, Gang Gan Feng, sorry, Gan Feng. They were going to deplace uh, uh, Gan Feng as the ma majority shareholder by buying more shares in the company, which they did for a while until they got the uh, the 
the the money that's associated with the IRA, they they qualified for it to the point to the tune of two point six billion dollars, and that's something that uh, uh, Kimberly uncovered last week that they had actually already been paid that money. So here you have the U.S. taxpayer on the hook for this money, and our government is allowing foreign companies to bid for these contracts to to mine rare earth uh, minerals and or elements here in the United States under NAFTA. As long as the foreign company is based in Mexico or Canada, they can qualify for this. And the Chinese companies, they're not going to uh, they're not going to just sit on the sidelines. They figured out a way to game the system by simply investing in these NAFTA based companies in uh, Mexico and Canada. Uh, and that would that's the background for my uh, question. So if you all have any questions on that uh, uh, before I show the video of my question, then we can discuss the fallout from my question, because the, my question spurred other journalists to pursue this story as well, because people were utterly shocked. There were two Reuters journalists next to me in a Bloomberg on the other side. I mean, and they all were shocked to hear this because nobody read the fine details of the IRA to figure out that foreign companies would under the guides of NAFTA can actually uh, qualify for the money, much less come into America and mine for rare earth minerals. It would have been like uh, awarding companies with majority um, investors from China the ability to drill for oil and gas on American soil and then export it because it, it does need to be exported. So go ahead. I want to add that um, you asked the question to two senators Yes. And one of the senators, I just want to forewarn people, was responsible for strongly lobbying and pushing this through. And he knew, was well aware of who actually owned Lithium Americas. And actually, is it America's Lithium? No, I, you it's, know, lithium anyway, America. it's it's you know, again, smoke uh, screens and and hiding behind an American label when they're not even an American company. And I just, it, it's very wrong. But China does this all the time. They buy into American name labels and leave the American name labels when the you know, hair does it all the time. So. Yeah. They, they, they actually yeah. pass a, a transparency yeah. act. And, uh, in yeah. case you guys don't know, the transparency act. And I actually had to file with several of our companies um, to, to let them know who the controlling interest is and the ultimate beneficial owners. Because for years, attorneys, if you want to come to the United States and do business, you can hide under a corporate shell and no one will know who the UBO is, the ultimate beneficial owner is. You can do that with trust also. I mean, it's common legal practice that you do that. Well, the Fifth Circuit just struck that down. So there's absolutely no question using legal entities such as uh, corporations and trust and other devices that foreign owners can come in and do this. I am uh, I think it's amazing that you actually uncovered the UBO, uh, Rex, because normally if they had good attorneys, you hide the UBO and no one knows who the ultimate beneficial owner is, but apparently yeah. you got the UBO. All right. Yeah, I wanna go ahead and play the question, but real quickly, they've done this in Argentina. Lithium Americas uh, in Argentina is known as Lithium Argentina. And again, Gan Feng, as of March 5th, Gan Feng bought back into Lithium Americas, and they're the number one shareholder. Now that they've got the $2.6 in the bank, they've circled back and have become the, the largest shareholder in Lithium Americas once again. So after the money, so I don't know what GM has to say about that or anything, but uh, let me go ahead and play the question, and you can, you can watch the body language on the, the senator. So let me get this set up real quickly. Uh, let me, where is it? You know, I would rather our government put the money back into our country. Well, and to our this? It's, all, it's also borrowed money. In other words, we, in went, we went into debt to finance this. So, you know, I just go, gosh, are you kidding me? Go on. Let's see if can we can you see the. That. Can you see? Yeah, we can see it. All you have to do is turn it on. Okay. So I got a question now. So I'm uh, Rex with uh, CyberTalk TV. Uh, regarding the uh, Thacker Pass uh, mining project, uh, Lithium Americas is the mining company there. It's a Canadian-based company, but their number one stockholder is Chinese-based um, uh, Genfeng 
lithium LTD. Uh, so regarding uh, uh, security and national security, uh, why is this happening? Uh, we we're told that if we migrate to green energy, we'll have uh, security here in the United States, energy security, yet we have foreign companies that are actually uh, mining the lithium, as well as uh, uh, those companies have Chinese investors. Thacker Pass, uh, lithium mine? Is that the only thing I can tell you about that? There's no way that they should be able to get any credits whatsoever to be used for towards the 3750 for automobiles. And that's what I think you're talking about. Or the 3750 that would accommodate to 7500. That was very clear that what we were doing is basically depending on uh, North America and free trade agreement countries. And we extended that to some of our allies. Right. Okay. They've got four countries of concern. You've got China, you've got Russia, you've got Iran, you've got North Korea. Any of their involvement to where they're involved in what we need for our country, if they have any control or, or the property by should absolutely be qualified. So yeah, we uh, but I don't know if anybody's investigated uh, Lithium of Americas to see who their uh, major well, investors are. Our attention. I'm not my staff, I'm sure not my energy staff. Uh, DJ got that they don't talk about. Okay, and it's we'll uh, it's again Fang uh, uh, Lithium LTD out of China. Thank you. Go give us your card. So that's the uh, that's the uh, the question there. So um, let me stop sharing. Um, so as you can tell, he said clearly that I'll have my staff uh, investigate it and so forth. However, in January of of 2023, Reuters did an article about the deal, and it was fast tracked through the Trump administration. And um, of all things, last year, Joe Manchin um, quoted in the article as saying this was a great deal and a deal that was a, as the result, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said it was a result of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Now, without it, uh, this deal wouldn't have uh, been able to be done. And he was touting the deal as a great deal. Well, back if you go back to 2021, Gan Feng was a... Um, majority shareholders, so they did not vet the company. Either they didn't vet it or they knew it, which is worse. I can't say they're lying or anything, but you saw the look on his face. He act like he knew nothing about it and said, hey, you know, stay. I did stay after the press conference and I met with his energy uh, press secretary as well as uh, Dan Sullivan's. And they wanted to know my resources and I gave them uh, to them and uh, so forth. And Joe Manchin told me specifically, we want to follow up with you on this. This is highly important. We want to know who their investors are. And I said, no, no worries. But since then, this was a week ago, Monday, the only press secretary to follow back up with me or press aid uh, was uh, Dan Sullivan's who followed up with me on Friday. Um, and they said they were going to investigate it, but I haven't heard back from Joe Manchin on this. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, Dave. Well, several well, things. Several things. Thanks, thanks, thanks for your efforts, Brett. Uh, 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 several comments. First, comments. first, these are a couple of examples of false of advertising false. that happens all the time in government-related activities. First, the Inflation Reduction Act. What a joke. It had nothing to do with inflation reduction. It was, among other things, a big green energy bill. Okay. Number two. Lithium Americas, what a joke. Who owns controlling interest in Lithium Americas? Uh, second point, China has a strategic plan that focuses on economic, diplomatic, military, cultural, and other dimensions. It is a long-range plan, and part of that plan includes the Belt and Road Initiative. Part of that plan includes efforts to try to obtain access to strategically significant rare earth minerals, properties, intellectual property as well, uh, agricultural property, etc., And they are executing on the plan. The United States has no such plan. Uh, you know, thirdly, um, candidly, we, we see all too frequently downright incompetence by the federal government in not only what it does, but what it fails to do. Uh, 
you know, the $700 billion that Rex mentioned and the other point that he mentioned that I think, Nick, you mentioned is it's not $700 billion. It's $700 billion plus interest. interest. If you end up adding the plus interest, it's a lot more than $700 billion. Yeah. It's we, 2. Need, we need an all of the above energy strategy. The administration needs to get a lot more realistic with regard to what reasonable targets are with regard to uh, carbon and uh, dates are with regard to that, because what they have now is totally unrealistic. Uh, and, you know, I think that we we just need to recognize the reality that uh, we got to get our act together. So uh, one, one of the things I wanted to just follow up with as well. That Senator um, Joe Manchin actually was involved with lobbying this and pushing this through. I think he was fully aware of who um, Lithium in America is known by. And, yep. you know, so it's right here. They publicly made a lot of announcements back in 2021. So there's a lot of things we are doing. You know, and I just think it's very slight of hand, but I think America should be very ashamed of itself to be giving money away to other countries like this when we need to be giving it back to ourselves. And I have one more question. I know Rex is going to bring up the risks that are involved with this, but where are we borrowing the money from to give back to China? And I say give back to China because odds are we're borrowing the money at very high interest rates to turn around and give it to them. So that's well, my yeah, question. Yeah, the answer is about 70% of the debt is domestically held. About 30% of the debt is foreign held. Uh, the largest foreign holder of our debt is Japan. The second largest holder of our debt is China. China is reducing their appetite for our debt for a variety of different reasons. The largest single holder of U.S. debt is who? Federal Reserve. We are self-dealing in our own debt uh, in order to try to keep interest rates down, not to have to go to the market for as much, which is short-term gain, increased risk of long-term pain. That There's got to be restrictions on that going forward as well. So if you do the math... The $1.2 trillion spending is $3,600 for every American, which doesn't come directly out of our wallets, but, you know, we can turn up more money. It comes out of the wallets by via inflation, because the more money you print, the more inflation you get, especially yep. when people lose confidence that we can control inflation, and then people just start jacking prices and doing shrinkflation, and you see a little bit of that going on. Um, in terms of Congress doing anything until 2025, not going to happen. This is one of the most evenly divided between Republicans and, and Democrats Congresses in history, and half of the Republicans are lunatics who love things being broken. We're going to lose another Republican in April because um, he got disgusted with you know the job. And that it's going to be even more evenly balanced. So you're, we've got nine, ten more months at the very least of stalemate. Eric, yeah, Rex. So I just wanted to follow up. It doesn't stop there because uh, you have to ask yourself what happens to the lithium after after it's mined. It gets even worse. There, there are no uh, lithium refining plants in the United States, as far as I know, that have that are up and running. I think there's a couple that are in development. So that means that the lithium that they pull out of the ground has to be refined. And the refining process for this is just as bad as an oil and gas refinery. It needs to be built near a water resource and it takes a ton of water and, and resources. So it's really bad for the environment, mining for it and then refining it. So more than likely it's gonna be export exported back to China because about 80 or 90% of all lithium that's uh, mined in the entire world has to go back through China to be refined. And then it will be put back into Chinese made lithium batteries, EV batteries, smartphone batteries and so forth, then sold back to the American consumer who paid for the mining to begin with, with the $2.6 uh, billion. The other issue that we're going to here is the fact that 
how who how how is that 2.6 billion dollars going to be spent by lithium americas are they going to spend it solely on stacker pass they they mine for lithium all over the world like in argentina or can they use that money to expand their op operations globally uh we, there's no there's virtually no oversight from end to end um in this uh, as well well as we all know money is fungible we found that out also with regard to the uh uh, the Iranian situation, where supposedly the money was going to be restricted, it could only be used for certain purposes. But okay, so you use other money for the purposes you don't want them to use this money for, then they can use this money to backfill where they took the other money from. Hey, hey, David. And hold on, and, and oversight. You know how the trillions that we spent on COVID, of which there was at least a trillion of waste, at least a trillion of waste, Congress passed legislation that would have created a congressional oversight a, a committee, but they never appointed a chair for it, so it never was operationalized. They, these people do not want transparency. They do not want accountability, and we have to end up paying the price for it. Hey, David, speaking of uh, transparency and accountability and all along those lines, and I'd heard because of definitely following Sarah Week, which uh, Rex and uh, Kimberly had been at and everything, but there is a, another part of transparency, and you had mentioned gentrification earlier that goes on regularly even in the lending space, and I was just wondering your thoughts around what I'm going to bring up, because in the minority community, there are a number of agencies that are lending agencies, and I think some of those lending agencies, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rex and Kim, are actually minority-owned as well, because I've actually read a couple of articles that talk about predatory lending, and yes, predatory lending does still exist, both in the African-American and the Hispanic communities, and all in that space. So I was just wondering your thoughts and maybe even some of the ways that we can get rid of some of these very bad practices where people are basically almost being forced into a new version of uh, sharecropping and all in that space because you are getting these loans and then oftentimes you are having significant amount of debt. I was reading one article where the woman was in her 70s and caught up in this predatory lending trap and everything. So I was just wondering your thoughts around that and if there are some things that we can do to get people out of that trap because it is a very significant problem that exists in our society. Sounds like a regulatory issue to me, but I don't know. Rex and Kim, I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. Kim, you're, um, you're muted. Uh, mine has well, a lot of what, 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 uh, we have a show about predatory lending that comes on at one o'clock on Mondays, um, Eastern Standard Time. So you might want to watch that. Um, my, I, I agree with uh, David, it is policy issues, and we need to put down more policies on how to protect people from, um, the predatory lending that's going on today. I, I just, part of it is mortgages, and mortgages is part of the financial crisis. The, the trillion dollar situation that um, we voted on. Um, and I want to discuss the way our, our country is spending money. And I brought this up on the last show, and I've mentioned this a few times. I want you to take a very simple example so that you can understand how they are, are being so irresponsible with our money. There is a, a really nice, simple example of um, comparing what is happening in D.C. to what if you take a, a family who earns $40,000 a year and they spend $75,000 a year. What would happen to them? Okay, nothing happens to our government. They act like they're kings and queens that can do whatever they want with our money without any accountability. And it needs to stop because if, if we did this or we went out and printed our own money to cover our debts, we'd be in jail. But Kim, along those same lines, but Kim, along those same lines, the, and I know we've got the show, and I definitely know that it'll be there. But they do say that the Supreme Mortgage Lending, which was back in two thousand eight, is what crashed the economy. And I've even heard you, David, talk about the Dodd Frank Act and everything. So oh, yeah. it does definitely tie into what we're talking about. So it's not just regulatory; it's also something that has to be done on a government level because that's even what that uh, act took place on. Because I've even heard you mention the Dodd Frank Act, um, David. 
Right, but they didn't effectively, yeah, effectively implement it. It's you know that that's part of the problem. You, you know, one of the issues we talked about is that it's totally inadequate oversight and enforcement. Right. Uh, and, and it's not just in in the financial area; right. it's uh, it's in virtually every area, including border policy. I mean, it's, you know, totally ineffective oversight and accountability for blatant violations of law. Yeah, Rick, Rick, Rick you had a comment. Well, so the, the the lithium is part of a larger jockeying between the U.S. and China over who's going to dominate the world technologically when technology just goes crazy. And, you know, we're, we're not well positioned to be nimble because our politicians are incompetent. However, we're lucky that uh, the current uh, leader of China is also not super competent. The, the previous guy was better at, at this. The new, the, the current guy is, is more dictatorial to, uh, to China's detriment. And somebody who knows more about this can comment. Yeah, I, 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 part, part of the research I did, and I talked about it before I uh, showed the question that I asked Senator Joe Manchin, was looking at the uh, U.S.-China uh, tech lobby, for instance, I want to go back to a quote that's highly relevant to this uh, from um, Eric Schmidt, the former uh, chairman and CEO of Alphabet, Google, Google's parent yeah. company. He yeah. said that Washington is an incumbent machine where the lobbyists write the, the, the laws or the bills. So when you see this thousand page bill that hit uh, on a Friday that was voted on that nobody read, that bill is actually every every K Street lobbying firm that represents every corporation that stands to benefit from that bill. Their law firms wrote the bill. This was this was true uh, in regards to the uh, uh, Affordable Health Care Act. Um, and Gruber, Jonathan Gruber, uh, who was the architect of it, actually stated this in public. He said that it was the insurance industry who put. Uh, um, keyboard to printer to, to publish that 4,000 page monstrosity. It's the same with the IRA and the omnibus bills. It's not our elected officials that are whose staff are writing these bills based on feedback from their constituents. Us, they're writing, they're not even writing the bills. I mean, Nancy Pelosi famously said we have to pass the bill to understand what's in the bill. Uh, uh, so that she said that in regards to the Affordable Health Care Act. So uh, real quickly, I'm going to give you one, one example here. The issue is all these lobbyists and these law firms are former congressional uh, members of Congress, and they're all former uh, uh, executives for these tech companies, for instance, in the tech industry. Um, and uh, so I'll give you an example of three people who are, two people who are um, uh, very critical to our government is Jake Sullivan, uh, intelligence advisor to the president, and uh, Anthony Blinken, uh, secretary of state, right? They're former Microsoft lobbyists. They were formerly Microsoft lobbyists who now are working our government. Eric Schmidt now is a presidential advisor on tech to Biden. So these people, not only are their companies writing our laws through their lobbyists on K Street, who funnels the money to our elected officials, they're influencing the very laws. And then the laws that they're passing have to say, I think the FTC, I think if we could have a class action lawsuit on deceptive trade practices, we could, we could uh, have a, a good lawsuit based on the names of these acts. It's, it's been proven that it's not the Affordable Health Care Act, it's the Unaffordable Health Care Act written by the, uh, in this, uh, the, insurance industry to benefit the insurance companies, not according to Rex Lee, according to uh, Jonathan Gruber, the architect of it. Hey, Rex, just really quickly, because I was looking up some stuff and everything, in that same space and everything, because I did see that uh, there's a company called Smithfield Foods, and I'm wondering if that's connected to Smithfield, North Carolina, that owns apparently 80% of the Chinese-owned land that is held uh, here in the U.S., because apparently China is only 18th of the companies that own that land here in the US behind the Netherlands, which actually has 4.95 acres. And I think Canada is the leading person that is owning a bunch of our land, as well as Italy, the United Kingdom and Germany. So there are a number of countries because apparently China is only 18th, but there is a billionaire named Sun 
Gung Hen that is apparently owns Brazos Highland Properties, LP and Harvest, Texas. So they were saying that a lot of the land is um, concentrated, like in Texas, it's a by a wind farm. I'm very familiar with Sun Gung Hen. The, the wind farm is located next to Randolph Air Force Base about eight minutes from my house. I live out here, and that was a big controversy. All he said he wants to build a wind farm outside of one of our strategic – Randolph Air Force Base is a strategic base. They fly all sorts of regular – air. it's like an air show here. If you look at the type of aircraft that they fly out of there um, and so forth. The other issue – let me go back real quickly. Um, David Urban. You all know who David Urban was? He was on CNN uh, for a while. He was one of – Donald Trump's leading presidential advisors, David David Irvin was. His K Street law firm is American Continental Group or ACG. Guess who they represent? They represent ByteDance, the developers of TikTok. So you have David Irvin, a former presidential advisor advising ByteDance. John Podesta's brother, Tony Podesta, a Clinton former presidential advisor and advisor to Obama, represents Huawei. So you have two presidential, former presidential adv uh, advisors that are lobbying for Chinese companies. Now, let me ask you all this question real quickly. And I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to tell you, because it's this is all relevant to the 1.2 trillion that was just passed and then the omnibus bill and the IRA. Y'all would agree that ByteDance is a social media company. They're in the software business for social media, right? Because they develop TikTok and Lemonade and other social media apps and platforms, right? Yes. Yes. So ask me this, answer me this question. Why the hell would they hire David Urban as their North American senior vice president? Did you know that? He has no software experience. He doesn't know anything about social media platforms or apps. Connection. Yeah, that's he's the same there. reason that, that, that the Ukrainian uh, oil company hired Hunter Biden. Connection. Exactly. So he here he's a former presidential advisor. Real quickly, I'm going to give you a list of bills that I've been researching since 2020 that ByteDance is lobbying against. The first bill is Bill HR 6837, no TikTok on Department of Homeland Security devices. Bill HR 4346, the Supreme Court Funding Act. They're also lobbying against the National Defense Authorization Act. Bill HR 8152, Consumer Privacy Rights Act. Bill HR 2731, Endless Frontier Act. That is AI development and competition in the United States. Bill S3663, Kids Online Safety Act. I'm going to read two more, and uh, then uh, uh, I'll open it up. Bill S-1260 and Bill H.R. 4521, the United States Innovation and Competition Act. That is the ability for U.S. corporations based in the United States to compete globally. Uh, and ByteDance is lobbying against this with David Urban's law firm, ACG. Bill S-1628, Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act. So you tell me that uh, ByteDance and TikTok are not a threat. That, that This is a national security threat. This means that the Chinese Communist Party through ByteDance is holding influence over U.S. politicians and government agencies that include the Department of Defense, the Supreme Court, and the Department of Homeland Security. Yes, this was all a quick these, right. 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 So all these tech issues are parts of trends that will make the world just so much <laughs> crazier. David, you write, wrote a book. You think about the future. America 2040, still a superpower. I'm writing a book set in the future. And a new study came out that said that by the end of the 20th of this century, U.S. the world population will go down because everybody's going to be wired in and nobody's making babies anymore. We, My wife and I shopped for an office chair yesterday, and the guy said, you don't want an office chair. You want a gaming chair that's designed for somebody playing games for 12 hours a day. In my book in the future, people are going to be like lying down, jacked into alternate reality, 
um, for 18 hours a day. And there's no way that's not going to happen. We're all our problems are part Rick, of this. Rick, it's, of Rick, it's already happening. My nephews are very much plugged into their Oculus set and all along those lines. I was just going to mention really quickly for those that are listening, Smithfield Foods is the one that I thought of that was in North Carolina, and apparently they own 146,336 acres of county for almost all of the Chinese-owned farmland in the state of North Carolina. So it well, is I'll, connected I'll, to I'll, most, the fertility problem is already with us. Our fertility rate in the United States is 1.64 per female, which is not replacement, which is one of the reasons that we need to have more immigration, but we need to have more intelligent immigration than what's going on right now. Go ahead. I disagree totally with that statement to some extent. I agree with you, we do need some Im Im immigration, but the issue is it's too expensive for people, for people born in America who aren't getting any subsidies to have children or have a family. Well, no, I understand well, that. Women, but that's not what I was talking women about. Women who have to fund their own that when the men don't step forward. I think that we just need to be more intelligent. And I think David is right on that. And I agree 100 percent. We need to be more intelligent on how we allow people into our country. Um, maybe a little more selective, too. But, you know, we've got our own problems here. And I think it's just a very big disgrace that we are so concerned and worried about and, and providing funding for other countries. They can do things when we don't even give to our own future and children. You know, we, we want to put them in so much debt. They can't even afford to live in their own freaking country. They invested in it. They put a lot of money into the schools. And that's a big disgrace. That's but, a yeah, huge but, disgrace to our society and our priorities. <laughs> We need to totally, but, our future but, 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 other countries. And I want to bring up one thing that Rex brought up. You know, our fear should be Huawei more than TikTok. Huawei owns the world's biggest telecommunication company. Okay. And if you dabble with people's communications, if you know how to get in and infiltrate it, which already all of our communications is pretty much infiltrated by every country in the world, controlling it through customer service. And Rex, you can back me up on this. So all it takes is one flip of a switch to cut off our communications in this country. And we gave it away. And Huawei probably owns all of that. So I, I truly fear Huawei. I've had dealings with them in the past more than I fear TikTok. You know, TikTok is controlling the minds of the, the, the future, but so is our country. So uh, I think, yeah. Oh, uh, I was just going to uh, try and touch in on everything. I think the lithium one is very interesting to me. And uh, I don't know of uh, many us owned lithium companies i think most of them are chinese or uh, australian or somewhere else none of them i don't think are from the us which would remind me of the keystone pipeline and i see that all, 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 pairs, all pairs from the united states are headquartered in pittsburgh and paul pelosi jr is on their board so altair is a, a us based lithium company I don't know if they would get it because of Paul Pelosi being on there then, because then it would be a conflict of interest. And no, it has that uh, uh, Hunter Biden and Christopher Hines, uh, John Kerry's sons, were invested in BHR, and that's a VC capital fund for alternative energy based in China. So it's called BHR, and both Christopher Hines and, uh, and Hunter Biden are invested in that uh, company. Right. They stand to profit off of these contracts because they're investing in them. So that's not the case. And then John Kerry's other stepson, real quickly, is uh, Andre Hines. He's on the board or was on the board of Obvious, the number one VC fund for alternative energy and green energy. And they stand to make billions of dollars off of the Inflation Reduction Act as well. So you have family members of congressional uh, leaders who are benefiting off of the policies that are being influenced by their fathers. And, and uh, members or mothers in Congress. So that would bring me to my question, though, is like, how is that different from all the oil lobby lobbying that's done or any of the other 
into any of the other lobbying that's there, because many of these lobbyists, especially even in the oil, in the energy industry, um, oil and gas, especially, that's where a lot of it. Real quick, I'll tell you how it's different. This is critical infrastructure. So if, if Taiwan were to attack China, China could then disrupt all of the lithium and cobalt that's used for these energies that we're migrating to. Let's say we go five years into the future and we're more dependent on these alternative energy sources. Now we're beholden to China. So if they attack <laughs> Taiwan and we go to de defend Taiwan, they could disrupt the supply chain for our energy. So it, it's a national security threat is what it is. But what I'm saying is, how is that different from the oil and gas when, Kim, for example, Kim, you were talking about. I, I was just going to say, how is that different than the oil and gas situation? Because when the Ukraine situation uh, started, that spiked oil. When stuff happens in the Middle East that spikes oil, that's still critical infrastructure. And that's still one of the energy sectors that spikes due to the fact of, you know, not everything being here. I understand the situation. I mean, we found the giant lithium mine. So now we're going to have lithium coming out of there. And there's all, there are other uh, uh, countries that are mining lithium. So I'm, I don't see it as that much different. And then when you go to the information. It, it, it has to be the U.S. oil and gas industry isn't dependent on China or Russia for their supply chain. But that's the difference. It, well, it is dependent upon OPEC and all everything in Russia, I thought, or everything. We produce more oil than any other country. But doesn't our so oil spike nice. when situations it's, go into problems? It's, it's it's yeah, not as yeah. bad. They're, they're, uh, so, I mean, that's, that's my point is that it spikes in causing an issue in our supply chain, which also that, that's an economic issue. issue, but not a national security threat issue. That's a whole right. separate issue. Yeah. Uh, well, Rick, Rick, and others are talking about our vulnerability to cyber attack. We can expect a lot of disruption. Option, but between now and the general election, seven and a half months from now, a month ago, uh, the Medicare's prescription uh, system was hacked by Russians, and I don't think they have it fixed yet. So old people are having trouble getting their drugs. You're also it's, having to deal with AI, and that's another. Real quickly, real quickly, I want to end with this: China had launched hybrid warfare against the United States in 1996. Hybrid warfare targets everyone. It's warfare without rules where everybody's a target, and it's based on 5th century B.C. Chinese strategist and military uh, general Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Right. The supreme art of war, he said, is to subdue your enemy without fighting. The greatest weapon of mass destruction that China has today is the U.S. dollar, and they weaponized that against the United States, and they're slowly infiltrating Every area of critical infrastructure from pharmaceutical drugs to electronics to now uh, rare earth mineral mining. They, the one area they can't disrupt is fossil fuels. They can't disrupt that, but they are disrupting everything that we're seeing that is involving green energy or alternative energy sources like hydrogen or nuclear. Hey, Rex. Well, hey, Rex, hold on a second. Isn't part of the problem that we're not actually uh, building up allyship as well? Because there is actually a significant amount of lithium that is in the African nations, and I don't think that we personally are doing enough to build our relationship with those African nations. They can do quite a bit in that space. As you may know, I went to Africa last year with a group of uh, corporations that include Nokia, and part of that um, initiative is to displace uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, decouple them. They can't decouple 100 percent. But what the African nations are looking to do right now regarding uh, uh, telecommunications is take out all those three and four G cores and replace them with five G cores that are uh, made in Western countries like Europe, uh, Ericsson and Nokia and so forth. Uh, now's the time we can displace some of that critical infrastructure over there and repartner with these African nations. I spoke at the uh, GC3B Security Summit in Accra, Ghana uh, in November of this year. And I'm part of that uh, uh, coalition of companies. I, I do all the cybersecurity for telecommunications for them. And they're, they're, they're trying to reestablish those relationships today. And we have an opportunity, at least in telecommunications, to do that. In cobalt, it's a done deal. 95% of all cobalt mined in Africa is uh, done through Chinese companies. Yeah. There's nothing we can do there, but we can 
we have an opportunity in telecommunications and tech. Let me let me close with this one comment. Let me close with this one comment, Nick. Yeah, go on. This is an example of China's strategic plan, which includes the Belt and Road Initiative, which is global in nature and which is focused on strategic resources. They are very active, not just in the United States, but in Africa, uh, in South America and other parts of the world. We need to get our act together and we need to do it quick. Bye bye. And as the Chinese say, may you live in interesting times and wear time out. We'll see you next week on Economics with the Honorable David Amor.